we were developing a mathematical theory of perception quite generally. And I still remember in 1986 realizing that the mathematics seemed to suggest that we might not necessarily see reality as it is. And that was really stunning. That, uh, and I, I still remember when, when I realized that I had to sit down because it was – I mean like everybody, I was a naive realist. I just assumed that we see reality as it is. But now the mathematics was suggesting to me that that may not be the case. Maybe we're literally just creating what we see and it's more like a user interface. So and we, we'll talk about that more. But instead of saying that our perceptions are a window on the world, maybe it's more like your desktop user interface. Um, Space-time could be just our desktop and three-dimensional objects like the sun, moon, and stars and apples and trees and so forth could just be icons on our interface. I need to look and ask the question, does natural selection favor true perceptions, perceptions that tell us truths about the structure of the world? Um, or not. And so about 10 years ago, 11, maybe 12 years ago, I started you know, learning evolutionary game theory mm -hmm. and got a couple of talented graduate students. We started running hundreds of thousands of simulations and so forth. And <clears throat> the simulations began to show, and we can talk about the details, but the simulations began to show that organisms that see reality as it is are never more fit than organisms of equal complexity that see none of reality and are just tuned to fitness payoffs. And so then I went to, you know, given those simulation results, <clears throat> you know, simulations are just simulations. Maybe we didn't get the right worlds, maybe we didn't sample properly and so forth, but it gave me enough confidence to say, okay, maybe there's a theorem here. So I proposed a theorem and went to um, my mathematical colleague, Chetan Prakash, and we were able to prove a couple, a couple theorems. One is that, um, According to evolution by natural selection, an organism that sees reality as it is um, is never more fit than an organism of equal complexity that sees none of reality and is just tuned to fitness payoffs. And, and then we've been, in the last couple of years, sort of diving into that a little bit further to ask you know, what's really going on. Evolution by natural selection depends on what's called fitness payoffs. You can think about you know, a video game <clears throat> in a Standard video game, you have to grab points as quickly as you can, uh, and, and if you get enough points, you might get to the next level of the game. If not, you die, and that's it. <clears throat> and in evolution, it's, it's very, very similar. There's, you know, whatever the world is, there are a bunch of these fitness payoffs, and you have to go through life grabbing fitness payoffs, um, and you don't get to go to the next level of the game yourself, but your genes go to the next level of the game. And so the question really is, do fitness payoffs – so no one, no one disputes that evolution will tune our senses, will shape our senses to report fitness payoffs. And that, that's, that's, that's standard. Anybody who understands evolution of natural selection would say surely our, our perceptions are tuned to fitness payoffs. So the real technical question is what is the probability that fitness payoffs actually still contain information about the structure of the world? And what we've been able to show is um, the probability that fitness payoffs preserve our, what, what mathematicians call our homomorphisms. They preserve structures of the world um, is zero. And the bigger picture on it is that to be – for a fitness payoff function to preserve a structure in the world, like say a total order, it has to satisfy certain equations. And that's hard to do. So it's the very fact that there are equations which you have to satisfy to preserve a structure means that most fitness payoffs just won't preserve it. So I believe it's a, a, a general result, but we're going through one by one and looking at various structures and showing a structure at a time. I'm proposing, based on evolution by natural selection, that space-time itself is just a data structure. So we tend to think of space-time as the – um, ancient pre-existing stage on which the drama of life has played out um, and that the universe in space-time existed for hundreds of millions of years, maybe billions of years before any life and certainly before any consciousness. And, and I'm saying that that view of space-time and therefore of all the contents of space-time is, is deeply wrong, at least from the point of view of evolution, that space-time itself must be just a data structure that we've evolved to represent fitness payoffs and the, and the costs to obtain fitness payoffs, roughly distance codes for the energetic costs that would 
I would accrue, uh, that I would incur to try to go over to, to grab that apple and, and eat it and so forth. So it's, 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 it's a representational system. And, and I'm saying not even uh, – yeah, I'm saying we don't see the truth. But even when it comes to fitness payoffs, the payoffs themselves are so complicated that even their evolution has had to really dumb it down. So we don't see all the relevant fitness payoffs. We have – only the fitness payoffs that will keep that that are necessary to keep us alive, you know, long enough to be grandparents, right? So, cosmic rays are going through my body right now, and they're going to kill me. Um, but I don't have no perception of them because they're not going to kill me until I'm not needed anymore. And so, so, so what evolution has done is it's really even collapsed all the fitness payoffs into really simple data structures. So space is just a data structure that we create and physical objects like apples the sun and the moon and human bodies are data structures that we create on the fly and they're solutions to a computational problem it's really interesting because no one else is thinking about objects and object perception this way but most of most people in my field think of um, the perception of an apple for example as a, what we call a Bayesian inference. There is a real apple out there. It has a real shape and a real color and a real texture. I use the image of my eye, the photons, as you mentioned, that are hitting my eye as the data. I use some built-in assumptions, what we call the priors, that are built into my brain. And then I infer the true shape, the true color, and the true texture of that apple based on the data I've got and the prior assumptions in my brain. So the idea is that we're re the perception is about recovering the truth, and I'm saying it, that that whole way of thinking about it is is wrong from top to bottom. Instead, a physical object like an apple is the solution to a computational problem, and the problem is how do you take the dozens of different fitness payoff functions that affect my life, that affect whether I'm going to survive and reproduce – compress them all down into a simple, simple format that gives me just what I need in this moment and how to act. So it tells me the payoffs and what I need to do them. And somehow physical objects like an apple are a solution to a computational problem. And that's an utterly different way of, about thinking about it. So space-time is a data structure which is a solution to a fitness problem, and so are physical objects. So I'm being thoroughgoing evolutionist here all the way. It's evolution and, and, and fitness functions and nothing else. You, know, you might say, well, the physicist might be very happy to put a cognitive scientist in his place. But, but it's quite interesting. The, um, some very prominent physicists are saying, and this is a quote, space-time is doomed. And among them are David Gross, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on the standard model of physics, Ed Witten, who, who's famous for his work on, on string theory and won the Fields Medal, and uh, more recently, Nima Arkani Hamed, who's at the Institute for Advanced Study. And what they're saying is, you know, space time has had a good run. Physics for several centuries, at least since Newton, has really been about what happens in space and time. And that's been a great framework. But now, as physicists try to grapple with merging quantum field theory with general relativity, and start looking at the data they're getting, um, the scattering amplitudes, the, 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 the amplitudes that they have to use to compute scattering events in the Large Hadron Collider. They're realizing that they have to let go of space-time. They're saying there's a deeper level of reality that's just not space and time, and it's not inside space and time. Space-time has to emerge as some coarse approximation, perhaps, or somehow it has to arise from a, a much deeper reality, and they don't know what it is. But, but there's a couple arguments for why space-time is doomed. One is that if you try to measure space-time at finer and finer scales, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you have to use higher and higher energies um, and also bigger and bigger equipment because to get the precision, you have to have bigger equipment. And it turns out with the higher and higher energies, uh, eventually you get so much energy concentrated in such a small region of space-time that you create a black hole. You destroy the space-time. And if you say, well, I'll, I'll try harder, I'll pump more energy, you just make the black hole bigger. So that's one problem with, with space-time. It, it, it doesn't allow you to even operationally talk about it after a certain scale. It, it, there's no operational meaning to it anymore. It, it, it ceases to have meaning beyond a certain scale. 
And a second problem that they're that they're coming up with, which is really interesting, is at the at the Large Hadron Collider, they they you know they smash protons together at near the speed of light. Two protons hit, and sometimes it'll, it'll be the inner guts of the protons that really smash. Like maybe two gluons smash into each other, and four gluons go smashing out. And this happens billions of times a second. And so they have to be able to find all the events that they know about and throw them away because that's not fun. That's that's not the interesting stuff. They're looking for the you know the the small little event that they've never seen before that, that opens up new physics. And it turns out if you do the mathematics to compute what they call the scattering amplitudes, the probabilities of these, these collision events, if you do it like Feynman told us, inside space-time, so you use space-time, you assume space-time is fundamental, you assume unitary quantum mechanics within space-time, it turns out you get nasty, nasty algebraic math that you have to compute to do it. For the simplest it, it, collisions, it may be dozens of pages. For many, it gets up to a thousand pages of mathematics because you have all these virtual particles in space-time that appear and disappear and you've got to take them into So this was impossible for them to do in real time in, in, in the collider because they, you know, even supercomputers couldn't keep up with that. So over the last 30 years, they've, the theorists have been trying to simplify the math and they've been able to do it. And what they found in every case is that the hundreds of pages of math can be reduced to an expression that only has one or two terms that you can compute by hand. And it's computing just a simple geometry, but it turns out it's the new object that you're computing to get these scattering amplitudes is not inside space-time. It's outside of space-time, and it has symmetries that cannot be expressed within space-time. There, there are symmetries that are not properties of space-time. So you have these two things. There are symmetries outside of space-time that are in our data that we can't capture in space-time. And second, when you go outside of space-time, the math becomes beautifully simple. When, it, when you force everything to be in space-time, it becomes ugly and nasty. So you're losing insight about the symmetries. You're getting ugly, nasty math. And so that plus the black hole stuff – are among the hints that space-time is doomed. And I'm saying evolution by natural selection is ganging up on space-time. It's saying space-time has to be just a species-specific data structure. There is a deeper – so I'm not, I'm not a solipsist. I'm not saying there's no objective reality. I'm a realist. There, there is an objective reality. But I'm saying that space-time and physical objects – are just our species-specific user interface shaped by natural selection. Right. We've got to look for a deeper reality. 